Today on In Grace, we are in Northern Arizona. How did these formations form? We're gonna tell you today on In Grace. Ever since I was a boy, I've been fascinated with God's creation. I'm traveling the planet to tell his story about his world. I'm Jim Scudder Jr. Come with me on another exciting adventure in grace. We have a really great in grace program for you today. We are on location in Northern Arizona. Here in Sedona, we see these beautiful red rock formations. And later we're gonna look at the Grand Canyon. How were these things formed? What was the geologic process to form these amazing, impressive, beautiful formations? From our viewpoint, there's only one thing that can explain it, and that is what the Bible describes as the global flood of Noah's day. A lot of people mock that concept of a flood, but you know what? We had a, another episode of In Grace inside the ark. Today, we're gonna show you outside the ark and what the world would have looked like and the catastrophe that would have taken place during and after the flood. I think it makes so much more sense as we study the geology of the flood. With the seemingly unending controversy over how the Grand Canyon was formed, we decided to go check it out for ourselves. So we hopped in a single engine Cirrus SR-22 airplane, along with our video team, and we set out from Chicago to Arizona to talk with a Grand Canyon expert by the name of Russ Miller. Hey Russ, good to meet you. Nice to meet you, Jim. Appreciate you coming on In Grace, and what a beautiful place this is. Oh, it's it's a special area, that's for sure. We're on kind of a tabletop uh, bluff in Sedona, Arizona. Yes. And all around us are these beautiful red rock formations. Um, you know, we're we're here to kind of ask the question: How did all this, all these formations happen? Absolutely, it's a big question. Uh, today, of course, as you know, secular geology teaches slow, uniform processes over long ages of time, and um, we can talk about why that's an issue. And uh, the biblical view is quick, rapid processes through massive, uh, catastrophic water flow. The Bible has a, a story about a massive catastrophe, uh, a water event that the world had never seen before or since, mm -hmm. and that really does explain all that we see around us. Well, it really does. And as you know, there's hundreds of ancient flood legends of a few people surviving a flood and repopulating the world. So ancient history supports what the Word of God tells us. So why would someone, let's say just a secular uh, geologist, why would they reject the idea that this, uh, these formations formed by a global flood? Well, of course, number one, that's all they've been taught. And most of them don't realize the reason for that, but as we're told in 2 Peter 3, 3 through 6, in the last days, people are going to claim uniform processes, that processes we see today have been pretty much the same since the beginning of the creation. And they're going to be willingly ignorant that by the word of God, the world that was being overflowed with water perish. They're going to deny the global flood. And today, secular geology is based on uniformitarianism, that processes are uniform and that there was no global flood. They have to deny the global flood or it would wipe out their belief system. Many may try to explain away the existence of the global flood, but we noticed so many marine fossils all across the continents and even on the highest mountains. So we asked Christian PhD geologist, Andrew Snelling about this. Well, the first thing is that we find marine fossils buried up on the continents. Now, in itself, that doesn't sound a big deal, but it is when you realise that marine creatures live in the oceans. We don't find them buried in the oceans. We find them buried up on the continents. And not just in lowland areas. We find them buried up in mountain ranges. And that means that the ocean waters flooded the continents in the past. So that's the first thing that's evident. And, and these, these marine fossils are not in their inconsequential numbers. We're talking about billions and trillions of them. In, in layers that, that the next point is that many of these layers can be traced right across continents and between continents. And so that means that the ocean waters, when they came up, 
went right across the continent. What is an evolutionary geologist explanation for that, for the, uh, the geologic record that goes uh, over continents and across the ocean? Well, they recognize that the ocean waters rose over the continents, but they say it was slow and gradual. And they say that the oceans came over and came back and it came over, came back. Well, there's two, there's two problems with that millions of years scenario. First, if it's slow and gradual, that gives time for ecosystems to move. A- animals and plants will, will move uh, to repopulate the, 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 their niche zone. If that's only progressing slowly, then it gives them time to move. But the fossil record doesn't show that. It shows them being wiped out without any time for them to change their location and move to higher ground and all those kinds of issues. Uh, The second point is that if you have uh, the oceans rising and falling, rising and falling slowly and gradually over millions of years backwards and forwards, you've got to have a mechanism for that to happen. And the only mechanism they have is uh, the land surface going up and down. But it's hard enough to explain how you do it once than to do it repeatedly. Uh, A prime example is in the Grand Canyon where the layers in the canyon are exposed and there's supposed to be for the whole sequence something like 17 advances and retreats. That means the whole plateau area, uh, half a million square miles has got to go down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. How do you do do that? What sort of mechanism causes that to happen? And they don't have a mechanism that will do that. So that that argument just doesn't hold water, for want of a better word. The fossil record clearly supports the presence of the global flood. But does the Genesis flood really explain the formation of the worldwide stratified layers? Yeah, well, you know, the secular interpretation, and they can't admit to a global flood because a global flood would explain how the Earth's strata form quickly all old earth beliefs, including isotope dating, are based on a belief that the strata formed slowly over millions of years with no global flood, as foretold would happen in 2 Peter 3, 3 through 6. Um, so there really is no viable way to explain it, the global flood. I had a, a Columbia University professor out here a few years ago, and he gave me a call and he wanted to talk to me about geology. And he said, he actually he said he wanted to straighten me out about my geology. And I said, well, I'll be glad to sit down and straighten you out about your geology. And, <laughs> and for you know, the first thing I did was I read Second Peter 3, 3 through 6 to him, that in the last days, people would claim uniform processes and deny the flood. And it physically shook him. I mean, it, it, it startled him. Uh, for about 10 to 15 seconds, he was, just, he was just stunned. And because, you see, everything secular geology teaches is based on a belief in uniform processes and no global flood. They cannot allow a global flood. A global flood explains how the Earth stratiform quickly, wiping out every. And that's probably place. why they have that theory of uniform layers mm-hmm. uh, over over the time to do away with the flood. Exactly to to discredit the Bible. And, and think about how awesome God's word is. Mm. This is two thousand years ago. The Bible foretells in Second Peter that in the last days, scoffers would claim uniform processes and deny the flood. Amazing. Well, think about who would care about the global flood? Yeah. Well, today, every old earth belief is based on a belief the layers form slowly Mm -hmm. and a global flood explains how they form quickly. God's word is really awesome. It's just beyond comprehension, awesome. The actual evidence is pointing to a global flood. Next, we go to Ken Ham and ask him what skeptics say to explain away this evidence. What does a skeptic answer when, when you give them something like that? Evidence that their assumption in, in the time frame we know about in this ice is wrong. How do they respond to that? Well, you know, I had Bill Nye here in 2016, in fact, one day after the ark opened to the public and walked him through all the exhibits and he saw that and he just, was saying, oh no, you know, that's that that's different, but it's not different. It's the same sort of thing. And then we had people who live in areas where they get a lot of ice and that ice then over time accumulates and changes into snow. And they said, hey, we can see lots of layers forming quickly and so on. And then they, they basically just reject it. You know, it's, you know what it reminds me of? In fact, this is true of a lot of areas in the whole 
creation evolution issue, dealing with origins and so on, you say, what do they say when, when, when you show them canyons forming quickly or rock layers forming quickly or, you know, ice layers forming quickly and so on? Remember what happened when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead? The religious leaders wanted to go and kill Lazarus and get rid of the evidence. Exactly. They knew he was raised from the dead and they still right. wanted to kill him and get rid of the evidence. We all have the same evidence, but how can we trust one person's view over the other? We can take what the Bible says and we can go out and test it in the real world. And so we can say, for example, the Bible talks about the flood. We would, if we didn't know anything about fossils, we'd read the Bible, we would expect that the ocean waters flooded over the continents. What evidence would we look for? We'd expect to find marine creatures in buried in rock layers right across the continents, and that's exactly what we find. And see, it's really your starting points. Your starting points or your assumptions determine the questions that you'll ask. And I find this is exciting because at the moment we have creation scientists doing research because they believe the Bible, they're asking a different set of questions than the, than the conventional scientific community. And so consequently their research agenda is different and they're likely to come up with answers that will, will, will give insights to the world that the evolutionary scientists will never find out because they're not asking the right questions. And I'm talking about practical issues. And we had a research meeting here just two days ago, um, but their research may give us answers on, on how earthquakes occur that conventional scientists will never find out simply because they're not asking the right questions from a biblical perspective. I believe that. And so if you read Genesis, you're going to expect exactly what you've found yeah. as you've been out and, of the field. And we need to remember that all the founding fathers of modern science were Christians and creationists. Isaac Newton, Maxwell, Faraday, these men wanted, and Kepler was, was famous for the statement, you know, he was thinking God's thoughts after him. These men believed that God was the creator. He'd put laws into the way the, the universe operated and they wanted to discover those laws. So they started with a biblical foundation and asked the questions and found the answers. And, and modern science has given us all the technology that we have today, but it didn't come from believing in millions of years. It came from a biblical perspective. I really enjoyed making this DVD series, The Ark of Noah, because it is more than a story. We interviewed people like Ken Ham and Andrew Snelling with Answers in Genesis. We toured this incredible ark, and yes, all the animals could fit on, and this DVD will tell you how that is true. Also, we went to the Grand Canyon. I fly you over the Grand Canyon. We explain how the Grand Canyon was formed and it was not the Colorado River. A lot of answers are in this DVD series. It's beautiful, it's entertaining, and it will help you understand the Bible even better. You need to get a hold of us today to get this DVD series. And when you give a gift, it helps us to continue bringing you great television. For your gift of any amount, we will send you Jim Scudder's series, The Ark of Noah, More Than a Story. Call 800-78-GRACE or visit ingrace.tv for more information. I don't think a Bible believer has to fear science. Mm -hmm. I think science is just observation of what we would say is God's creation, God's earth, and, Absolutely. and the processes that he allowed, judgment of water. We also believe the Bible, as it says, there's gonna be a, another judgment. It's gonna be a judgment of fire. And there's, a, there's another judgment that's an eternal judgment for anyone who rejects the love of God, mm -hmm. rejects Jesus Christ, and that's hellfire. So we see evidence of God's judgment all around us, literally, as we stand here, and anywhere in the world, people could see evidence of the global flood. It, obviously global. Because you have billions and billions of fossils all over the earth, all of these different layers laid down, it had to have been a global flood. Absolutely. So we see evidence of God's judgment, but then if we, if we do away with the flood, we do away with God's judgment also, I think, in the future. And I think that's what mm -hmm. maybe is part of this, why people are rejecting young Absolutely. earth creationists. The real goal of the of the enemy is to undermine people's faith in the authority of God's word. And Jim, I know you've had experience with this. We we can teach our kids what the Bible says, and they they can memorize it word for word and cover to cover. I wish I wish they would. But if they then become convinced it's not true, it doesn't matter if they know what it says. And so the attack is um, 
uh, through the public schools and especially once they get into secular colleges. And we need to prepare them to understand why uh, real science is a believer's best friend. Yeah. Uh, most folks don't know it, but of the 200 or so branches of modern science, over 80% were started by Christians That's right. to study God's creation. There wouldn't even be science today without Christianity, exactly. but that's been undermined over the past 150 years. Right. Humanists and secularists now own the system, they own the schools. And people ask me all the time, Russ, what evidence do you have the Bible's true? Well, I always say the exact same evidence atheists use to say it's not true. Exactly. I mean, we live in the same world, right? We all have the exact same evidence. It's it's never been about the evidence. It's about who gets to interpret that evidence. That's it. And the other side owns the system and they give their interpretation of the world in the place of science. They teach their interpretation as if it were science. And that is what is misleading people, not science. A, a misinterpretation of the world based on a, a faulty starting worldview. That's, that's what the issue is. I asked geologist Dr. Andrew Snelling if he were to stand on the rim of the Grand Canyon, which he's done many times, to describe the evidence for the global flood. Well, first of all, I'm gonna point out that we're standing at the south rim of the Grand Canyon at 7,000 feet above sea level. We're over a mile above sea level, and yet the rocks we stand on at the rim of the canyon have marine fossils in them. I mean, these are creatures that lived in, on the ocean floor. What are they doing up there? And as I've said a moment ago, these are, is evidence that the ocean waters flooded the continents. It's also evidence that there were earth movements. Many people don't realise that we find marine fossils up near the top of the Himalayan mountains. And people say, oh, does that mean the Himalayas were there before the flood? No, the Himalayas are made out of marine fossil bearing layers, which means that it was the, the material was at a lower elevation before as the ocean waters came in over the continent, made those rock layers, and then the layers were pushed up to form the mountains that we have today. Everyone agrees that the world's mountains formed late in, in Earth history. And that makes sense because in Psalm 104, we read that the end of the flood, when the waters retreated, the valleys sank, the mountains rose. And that's an indication. Likewise, when we read uh, that the ark landed on the mountains of Ararat, we have to remember that it's not just simply the water level. The, the, earth, the land surface may well have been pushed up, those mountains being pushed up to snag the ark if, before the water started to retreat. And that certainly fits with that area in the Middle East because there are active active zones where mountains have formed. You know, the European Alps system the, the, um, the zone goes through the Middle East area and right over to the Himalayas. That's a continuous zone where in the past, sections of the continents have actually collided with one another and produced those mountain belts as a result of the buckling of the strata. It's interesting, Jim, that the whole idea of continental drift actually started back in, in 1859 when a Christian geologist proposed not continental uh, drift, but continental sprint during the flood. He read in Genesis that on the third day of creation, God gathered the waters together in one place. So he, he said, well, maybe the land was all in one place. And uh, that fits because <clears throat> today we have many continents, but we can actually put them together back like a jigsaw puzzle. And we can match rock layers across continents, between continents, so we can match up the Caledonide Mountains with the Appalachians if we push North Europe back over against North America, which means the Atlantic Ocean Basin opened up late during the flood. The Appalachian Mountains are actually made of fossil bearing layers that were produced during the flood. A collision of, of earth materials, of earth plates, crustal plates, continental plates during the flood produced those mountains then the Atlantic Ocean Basin opened up and so the Pacific was now colliding with Western North America and produced the Rocky Mountains later while the Appalachians were being eroded down, which is why the Appalachians are a lower elevation than, than the Rocky Mountains. And they're, have an appearance old. that they're older. They have an appearance that they're older. So there are many of those, these kinds of features. At the Grand Canyon, I spoke with my friend, theologian J.B. Hickson. He is the head of a ministry called Not By Works, and he was leading a tour with people from his ministry. This gorge behind us is one of two things. It's evidence of 
millions and millions of years, uniformitarianism, yep. or of catastrophe. Now, we know the Bible speaks of a global flood. Yeah. Which one makes sense to you? Yeah, absolutely, the global flood. Uh, 2 Peter 3 talks about in the last days, people will deny the global flood and also deny the second coming. And, uh, and so, you know, the only way to explain the evidence is through a, 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 you know, a massive global flood that brought about what we see behind us here, uh, not over millions of years, but as a result of God's judgment on sin. And, you know, the Bible also talks about how in, in, in uh, uh, the Olivet Discourse, as in the days of Noah, so shall it be. And I always like to remind people, you know, in Noah's day, people were unprepared, even though God clearly gave them a warning through Noah, and they ignored it. Today, we have similar warnings, and God is, is the gospel's going out, whosoever will, let him come drink freely of the mm -hmm. water of life, and yet people are turning a deaf ear, and this is a stark reminder of, of what, what's coming. Jesus is the Word of God. Yes. The ultimate, you know, the, the Bible is the Word of God, but Jesus is the ultimate expression. And and He's our Creator. All things are made by the Word, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And I just try to let, get people to see that they can they can read God's Word and they can believe what it says. You know, the secularists are out there throwing all sorts of stumbling blocks out there, and the, one of the biggest ones is uh, the millions of years of time. Right. And, you know, Jim... A lot of Christians don't see why it matters. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they'll they'll say, "Hey, thousands of years, millions of years, billions of years—who cares?" But see, there's a big problem there. I granted, technically, the the millions of years or thousands of years, other than it being the, the authority of God's word, that's not the issue. The issue is the old Earth beliefs, which are today's old Earth beliefs were only invented about 215 years ago. They're a fairly new invention. What they do is, in people's mind, they put death, looking on a time scale here, here's Adam, they put death before Adam. Mm -hmm. Well, the foundation of the gospel message is that God gave us a perfect creation. Well, what in the world happened to it? It's full of death and suffering today. You, you hear people say all the time, hey, how can we have a, a world full of death and suffering if we have a loving God? Well, the answer is simply, God didn't give us the world the way it is today, full of death and suffering. He gave us a perfect creation, yes. but Adam's original sin corrupted the creation, yes. allowing death to enter, separating us from God, requiring our redemption through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The old earth beliefs, the millions of years and, and such isn't the key issue. That's why people miss it. It's that they put death before Adam, yes. undermining the foundation for the gospel message. Yeah. And that's why whether or not there's a global flood is an important issue. It is, it is. We were gonna kind of end the show today here at the path to dead man's past. And whenever you start to think of a past that's called dead man, I think there must have been a guy that was dead in the past or something like that. I'm not sure of the history, but I know one thing, all of us are gonna face a physical death. All of us one day are going to have to stand before God and answer, what have we done with Jesus Christ? Now the flood was God punishing and destroying the world, but you know what? The ark, a picture of salvation. Jesus is a, not just a picture of salvation, he is salvation. And so anyone who puts their faith and trust in him is gonna be saved from a more desperate catastrophe than the flood, and that is the earth being destroyed by fire. Judgment is coming, and you and I need to be ready. We all have sin. Let this be sin and all of us have sin. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. Jesus, who knew no sin, watch, was made sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The transaction was we were sinners, Jesus took our sin on a cross, and whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Put your faith in Jesus, the ark of salvation. I really enjoyed making this DVD series, The Ark of Noah, because it is more than a story. We interviewed people like Ken Ham and Andrew Snelling with Answers in Genesis. We toured this incredible ark, and yes, all the animals could fit on, and this DVD will tell you how that is true. Also, we went to the Grand Canyon. I fly you over the Grand Canyon. We explain how the Grand Canyon was formed, and it was not the Colorado River. A lot of answers are in this DVD series. It's beautiful. It's entertaining, and it will help you understand the Bible even better. You need to get a hold of us today to get this DVD series, and when you give a gift, it helps us to continue bringing you great television. For your gift of any amount, we will send you Jim Scudder's series, The Ark of Noah, More Than a Story. 
Call 800-78-GRACE or visit ingrace.tv for more information. Here at InGrace, we have been so blessed as God has opened up a lot of doors for some really great Christian television. Coming up this fall, we've got some really great programs for you. We are going to take you on a search for temple treasure. Most scroll scholars would tell you the copper scroll by itself is very boring. It's like reading an old grocery list or an old inventory. It's the grand sum, it's the potential for the holy items that it's pointing to. That's what makes the copper scroll so thrilling. The third location on the copper scroll, it says 900 talents of polished gold. We are gonna take you on an archeological adventure in Shiloh. The tabernacle was there for hundreds of years and they're finding more and more and more. When you do an excavation, you get a lot of artifacts, buildings, and all kinds of material, but it's silent. It has to be interpreted. And the Bible is your number one source for the history of that area and what took place there. The Bible says that God smote the Syrians and they fled. Well, Sennacherib tells us the same story. That's ancient history right there. The Pentagon represents the mightiest military force in the world. And at 936, we felt a large explosion. It was a life-changing day we should never forget. You definitely want to set your DVR and record every single In Grace episode. Don't miss one of them. And you will be so blessed as we learn all about God's world and God's word. In Grace is a viewer-supported ministry. Thank you for your prayers and gifts. Make the Bible come to life in a whole new way. Join Jim Scudder Jr. and Dr. Carl Baugh, March of 2020, for an amazing guided tour through Israel. See places like Qumran, Galilee, and the Dead Sea. Experience the holy city of Jerusalem and witness the place of Christ's resurrection. Call 800-78-GRACE or visit ingrace.tv for your free brochure. Call now, 800-78-GRACE. Hi, I'm Jim Scudder, the pastor here at Quentin Road, and the Bible tells us that God is love. Our church is a place where you can experience His love. God has given us His Son, He's demonstrated His love, and we believe that. We've received the love of God, and I believe that's the one thing that's going to really stand out for you when you visit us here at Quentin Road Baptist Church. You're gonna find people that love God, and they care and will love you. So I hope sometime soon you'll come and see all the things that we do from old fashioned Bible preaching and teaching to great kids ministry and a lot of other things that we do around here. We want you to experience God's love at Quentin Road.